As a church, full of faith and full of life, we want to take this moment to not only honour you, but also to honour God. Amen? The ultimate father figure. The ultimate father in all of our lives. And he is the one who has placed the calling on each of you. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14, Paul gives us this powerful charge. He says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. It's powerful. And this passage is a call to all of us. But today I want to especially encourage the dads in the house, the father figures in the house. Firstly, I want to encourage you to be on your guard. In a world that often challenges our faith and values, we need men who are vigilant, practicing and protecting virtues in their families, in communities, in our workplaces and leading people towards God's truth. We need to stand firm in faith. Your faith is a foundation not just for you alone, but for those who look up to you. Your children, your peers, this church, your workplace, your sporting clubs. And when you stand firm in your faith, it inspires people. It inspires those who are looking at your life. Also from this verse, we're encouraged and challenged to be courageous. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the determination to do what is right despite the fear. And being strong isn't just played out in the physical. It's the strength of character, of integrity, the strength of spirit and strength of conviction that we carry, that supersedes our physical strength. And finally, it challenges us, this scripture, to do everything in love. One of the greatest attributes of a father is the love that he demonstrates to those he cares for. Whether it's leading your family, serving in the church, or interacting with those around you, Let love be the motivation behind all that you do. It's in this love that we truly reflect the heart of our Father in heaven. So men, today we honour you for the roles you play and we encourage you to keep on walking in faith. To demonstrate strength. And wisdom that God provides for you. Your influence matters. Your faithfulness is seen. And your love leaves a legacy. As we honour you today, let's also honour God, who is our ultimate example of a father. May he empower you to lead with his heart, to serve with his hands and to love with his limitless love. So I say to all of you today, happy Father's Day. May God bless you abundantly as you continue to live out his purpose for your life and your family's life. Can we give our dads a mighty cheer? We uh, have got some mighty men in our church who are just, I find, um, to be incredibly inspiring people. Um, And we've picked a couple of them today to share. Uh, And uh, we're going to start with one of the generals, not only of our church, uh, but in our movement and in our city and in heaven, to be honest, because he'll be celebrated in heaven without a doubt. Our very own Pastor David, can you make your way up here? Share a few words with us.
Let's give him a big clap as he comes up. Good morning, family. It's good to be here. Some mornings you don't want to get out of bed, but hey, life happens, doesn't it? Hey, um, I'm, my name is David, as has been said, and I'm honoured to be part of the team here. And the, the things that I share, I just trust that it just sparks a little flame of hope and encouragement within you. Um, I come from a different time zone. I came from a time before mobile phones, the internet, coloured television, drive through car washes. A man is washing the car with his son. And the son asks, Dad, can't you use a sponge? The world has changed. The world has changed from when it was when I was a lad. Family is one of the most precious gifts we've been given. It provides a cornerstone of childhood and the backbone of our belief systems. It is where we learn to expect from other people and where we identify the boundaries of good behaviour. God's plan is for parents to have their children's best interests in mind. I'm not saying that every family is perfect, for that's far from true. But what I am saying is that parents are the most valuable leaders that we have for creating a better future. The good news is we as parents don't have all the answers. We have a Heavenly Father who has them instead. My grandfather on my father's side uh, was Irish and he had a farm, farm in Ireland. And one day a travelling preacher came through the community and he wanted to hold some meetings. He wasn't able to in the local church. And Granddad Tomkins said, you can put your wagon in my paddock. And as a result of that, every one of my dad's brothers and sisters came to know Jesus. I didn't find that out until I went to a family funeral. Uh, and my grandfather on my mother's side, he was Welsh and he was a successful business person. He was a goodly man and he was a godly man. And his name was Charles Chatham. And he was just so incredible. In Exodus chapter 6 verse 8 and Psalm 128, Psalm 128, it, Scripture tells us that our God is a generational God. The number one goal in parenting is to lead our children to a personal relationship with Jesus and to show them how to walk with him. Legacy, as Pastor Aaron said, legacy. Often when we think about legacy, it is something that's been left behind from someone that's passed or maybe a something, a keepsake, but the greatest legacy that one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or material things accumulated in one's journey of life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. May we build a legacy of the Word of God that we've invested into the coming generations. I come from a dysfunctional family. My parents love the Lord dearly. However, they separated when I was at the age of nine and my brother was at the age of seven. I have a photograph of, of my dad. I've only got two photos of my dad. And he was an incredible man. And irrespective of the journey that happens in life, I am so indebted to my father and the godly 
and the goodly men that have helped shape me into whom I am today. As men, we often walk around with a backpack full of rocks. These emotional rocks we put in these backpacks things that have happened in the journey of life and it's aptly, absolutely exhausting. As a male, you're told to man up. You're not allowed to show any mental or emotional weakness. We're also press prosecuted for what our forefathers did, even though we didn't actually do anything. And when we try and unload those rocks, it can feel like nobody cares, but our Heavenly Father does. And he sees all of the rocks and he wants to carry them for you. So irrespective of your journey, I challenge you, I encourage you, you can leave that pack at the foot of the cross. Our sins, our failures, our wrongs, whatever it is, we can leave it at the cross. In Psalm 34 it says, and I found this to be so true, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you godly people, for those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes grow hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Our past does not define our future. When we trust in the Lord and take refuge in him, your mess will become your message. Your test will become your testimony. A true father will never give up on his kids. We learn that from our heavenly father. No matter what you've done, he has not given up on you. Remember that there is one who is a father to the fatherless. I am now an older father and a grandfather. I have a married daughter, a son-in-law and a grandchild. My greatest desire and challenge is to leave a legacy to them. I am talking about a legacy of faith. The greatest thing that I can give to them is my story of over 65 years of living for Jesus. The good and the bad, my victories and my losses. I don't know your story as a man in your family, but your family needs to hear it. If it's not good, our Heavenly Father can help you change it. Your family needs your legacy. I personally believe that we can change the narrative. I believe that you can be in God's face concerning your children and your grandchildren. Pray until something happens. Push. Pray until something happens. In Luke chapter 18, verse 7, it says, And will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I find my God, my Father, hasn't. Today as men, we can stand in our actions. Our active faith has the potential to influence the direction of our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor David. That's incredible. Could we um, have that photo of Pastor David's dad just back up there quickly? You imagine um, this man who obviously I never met, but he obviously had a heart after God and prayed for his family and their children 
And then to have the legacy that he's had. Pastor David has been serving in this church since he was 17 years old. Praying for young people, encouraging young people. And he has three generations of his family serving in this church. Today alone. Wow, the, pr- the prayer of a father is powerful. What a legacy. What a legacy. Great Great encouragement. Thank you, Pastor David. We love you dearly. Can we thank Pastor David again? So good. Um, and just because it's hard to remember names, so we just picked another David to preach. No, that's not why. Uh, David, come on up. David Stokes, can we give it up for David as he comes to share with us? Bless you, brother. Good morning. I brought props. I can't help myself. I started in kids' ministry. I need props. It's all good. Good morning, everyone. My name is David, and I have the privilege of being part of the team here at Chosen Church. It is actually an incredible privilege. Another privilege I have is being a dad. I've been a father for the past nearly 15 years. Oh, that hurt. Oh, that makes me feel really old, actually. Um, But I have a one-year-old, so that makes me feel younger. So 12-year gap between two of my kids, which is amazing. And it's really rejuvenating to follow around a one-year-old, I've got to be honest. Being a dad is a privilege. And in fact, I remember when my son Daniel was two. And I have a photo of him when he was two, actually. Wasn't he cute? Oh, he was cute. Daniel was two. And uh, I'm getting ready to go to work. Now, I wear a suit to work. I have a suit, a tie. You know, I get all nice and clean and get ready for work and get my hair just the right amount of messy Spend a whole lot of time getting ready in the morning and in walks Daniel. Daniel's been playing outside. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a two-year-old who's played outside in the dirt. They're not clean. And I was. And he runs in and he goes, Daddy! Hug! And it's so cute. And I didn't want to. I've got to be honest. I did not want to. He runs in and I have a choice. Do I... Uh, no, 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 no. Stay back, stay back. You are dirty, I am not. (laughs) Do I uh, call his mum? Oi, oi, oi! Come grab him, get rid of him. Or do I bend down, get on my knees like God got on his knees for me and give him a hug? Because that's exactly what God did for me when I was dirty and I was messy and I was really, really gross in his eyes. Now, Let's keep moving on. Daniel's now 14. I have a photo of him when he's 14. In fact, he's there serving in church on on camera. And uh, a bit less cute maybe? I don't know, maybe. I shouldn't say that, should I? (laughs) Now, Daniel's 14 and an absolute gem, as all teenagers are. And one day, he's a bit cranky and he screams at me, I don't want to live here anymore, I hate you! Ow! That hurt. And again, I'm faced with a choice. Do I scream back at him? That's fine. Get out. Go, I hate you too. Or do I gently remind him that that's actually not true? You just feel that way right now and that I love you anyway. Well, I've got to say, there are probably the only two times in my life that I've got the response right. Yes. Because I screw this up all the time. But church, I've got to tell you this morning that how we respond matters. How we respond matters. So here's the question, church. When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're stressed or disappointed, how do you respond? I'm just going to let that sit with you for a second. Now I know what you're thinking. It's probably a bit like me. I just get angry and I snap back and it's not my fault. It's not a choice. I just do it. I say that too, but God keeps reminding me actually that's not true. Which brings me to my very first and most important point today. How we respond is a choice. A more honest response would be, I don't want to respond badly until I do. And then I really, really, really want to respond badly And then I regret it. I think that's a more fair assumption. 
So I've come up with a bit of a process for how to respond that I want to share with you this morning, church. First of all, number one, pause. In James 1.9, the Bible says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The second step is to seek God. In James 1.5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And thirdly, choose grace. In Ephesians 4.2, the Bible says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Once you've done all that, then respond. But it takes more than just a quick three-step process, guys. Like I said, I don't want to respond well in the moment, right? I want to snap back at the other person. I want to throw things in their face. I want to get mad. And that's because, and this is my second point, how we respond is influenced by what's inside of us. In Matthew 12, 33 to 35, the Bible says, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. And we talk about the fruits of the Spirit, right? Then it goes on to say, you brood of vipers. And oh, that hits me because, as I said, that's me. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Now, I have this cup. It's water. Yep, definitely water. (laughs) If I were to splash this on you, look, you might be a bit wet. But, uh, look, it's it's not going to kill me. It's actually kind of refreshing, in all honesty. It's uh, just going to dry, no problem, that's okay. But let's say I add in something that's uh, sticky, dark, and kind of tastes gross. To be honest, I am not a fan of this flavour. Yeah, I still don't like it. Okay, if I were to spray this, actually I don't want to. If I were to spray that on myself right now, that's not going to be as nice and refreshing as it? it's going to be sticky, It's going to be gross, and I'm not going to be very comfortable with it. The truth is, what I put in is the influence of what comes out, right? If I spend my day sitting down watching TV, feeling myself with the world, being bitter and angry about all the things going on around me, I am filling myself with the very things that are going to come out of my mouth when I'm stressed, On the other hand, if I fill myself with God's word, if I spend time in his presence, if I'm grateful for the things that I have every day and I fill myself and surround myself with godly people, then the response from my mouth is going to be one that's godly, that's kind, that shows the fruit of the Spirit. What I put into me influences what comes out of me. The choice of what we pour into ourselves is ultimately ours. By choosing to resound ourselves with the right influences and seeking guidance from God, we can ensure that when we pour, or when we're angry, splash out of ourselves, it's life-giving and not destroying. And that's the point. And that is my third point today. How we respond is a matter of life and death. Oh, David, that's a bit over the top. Well, actually, I don't think it is. The Bible actually talks about this. In Proverbs 18.21, it says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, that's a scary thought. How I respond can impact all of the people around me, but no one more than my family's entire life. Now, I've got to be honest, my tongue is out of control sometimes. 
And the Bible talks about that too. In James 3, 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. That is, that is scary. That's part of me. That's really challenging. So we need to make the decision to tame it. James 3 is talking about how to tame the tongue. And it's effectively telling us that, we, that how we respond matters. In fact, it goes on at the end to tell us how we should respond. In James 3, 17 to 18, it says, But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving. It's gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. And it's important because the Bible says in Matthew 12, 36 to 37, that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken, even the empty ones. By your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned. How we respond is a matter of life and death. So dads, husbands, grandfathers, and everyone else, how we respond matters. How we speak to our family matters. We need to demonstrate to our families and especially our children that how we respond matters. When our children are inconvenient, when they say hurtful things or mess up more than we can even imagine, by choosing to respond with love and compassion, you're not only showing them the love of God, but also Modeling the kind of behavior that we're called to as followers of Christ in Ephesians 4.32. If the, tr- if the tongue truly holds the power and life and death, and the Bible says it does, then their lives genuinely depend on it. Now, before I wrap up, I would be amiss if I didn't talk about one more response that matters. And that is the most important response you'll ever make. This is the response to the call of Jesus Christ. And once again, it's a matter of life and death. And if you haven't responded to that call, that knocking at your heart, I encourage you, come and chat with one of the team. Come and speak to me, one of the team after the service. We would love to pray with you. If you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, Today is the day where you need to make sure you know because anything could happen tomorrow. It is the most important response you'll ever make and how we respond matters. Good stuff. Thank you, Dave. Can we give him a big round of applause? Thank you. So important. Such a great encouragement and lesson for us. And I love how God trickles things through, like current, keeps the themes of things going. Obviously, um, Pastor David shared with us an opportunity that his father, his family had to say no to somebody traveling and opens the door, says yes, responds in the right way, in a godly manner that affects generations to come. And just like uh, David sharing with us, the way that he responds, the way we respond, the way that we talk to those who we love and care for and influence makes such a big difference and we see that in David's family with um, his amazing son Daniel serving so full heartily a mighty man of God in his own right at 13 just championing um, the things of the world um, you know and and growing into a great man so um, keep speaking life very cool indeed hey we're going to get the amazing Levi Rocker up to share with us give him a round of applause good man the best dressed man in the house. Praise the Lord. Sorry, I'm just having technical difficulties right now. 
just when I need it. Praise God. Well, happy Sunday and happy Father's Day, church. To me, being a father is one of the greatest joys and roles in life. And today, I'm very grateful that I can celebrate this incredible journey of fatherhood with all you fine fathers in the house. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'd like to spend the next few minutes sharing with you about the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father and His heart towards us. I'd like to call up Tyrus to help me illustrate this. Come on, Tyrus. Come on. This is Tyrus, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. You know, he wasn't always this tall. He didn't always know how to tie his shoelaces. He didn't always know how to wash the dog's bowls or sweep up the house. But thankfully, he does. He won't always be the same as he is at 12 years of age, but as he matures, he will undeniably change. And with that, his conditions and his circumstances will change also. Now, Taurus hasn't started working yet, and more importantly, he hasn't started paying me back yet. (laughs) Just kidding. Honestly, he's cost me a lot of money, a lot of time, effort, and sleep. But I have no regrets. I've found great joy and fulfillment in getting to raise him. You know, when I first heard that I was going to have a son, I was overwhelmed. I was scared, but not scared of him. I was really scared of becoming a father. I felt shocked, surprised, and excited all at the same time. You can ask Joy, my wife. (laughs) Tyrus made me a young father at just 20 years of age. But, But even before he was born... I already felt a deep connection to him. I hadn't met him or seen him yet, but I knew that I loved him. Even before he took his first breath, Tyrus claimed a position in my heart. Tyrus's place in my life was not something that he had to earn. He didn't have to strive or work for. His position in my heart, he holds, is my son. This identity was given to him simply by being born into the family. It's his birthright, something that he inherited naturally. My love for Tyrus flows from the undeniable fact that he is my child. So no matter how tall he grows, how well he, he learns to tie his shoelaces, how much he helps around the house, and how much he will eventually earn for himself or accomplish or do in this life, these circumstances and conditions will change, but what remains constant is my unwavering, Love for him. His identity and position in my heart, which is a dearly loved son. Now I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, conditions and circumstances change. Now turn to your other neighbor, who wasn't your first choice, and say, but your position in God's heart will never change. Praise God. Thank you, Tyrus. The father-child relationship is a picture of God's love for us. You and I, his children. The Heavenly Father's heart and love for us is constant. It's unwavering, it's patient, long-suffering and enduring. It's not dependent on our ever-changing conditions and circumstances. In God's heart, you are deeply loved, fully accepted and forever secure. His love for us is not something that we earned or deserved. It's not based on anything that we've ever done. He simply loves you because he's called you his own, his son and his daughter, a child of the most high God. 1 John 3 verse 1 tells us, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. To have a close, intimate relationship with God, we must understand that our our position in in his heart will never change. In the Father's heart, you are always his beloved child. Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his, of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you to see that this is an amazing reality. You are a child of God. You're in the family of God. You are an heir through God. You have a kingdom inheritance because God sent forth his son Jesus to die on a cross for you and I. 1 John 4, 19 gives us the key. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. The key to this scripture is that he loved us first. This means we need to receive the Father's love before anything else. If we don't receive his love, we end up working for God's love rather than working from it. I'll say that again. If we don't receive his love, we end up working for God's love rather than working from it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what did he make a way for? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. <laughs> he made a way for us to enter into relationship with the Father. Jesus came to earth not only to bear our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and forgive us of our sins, but he also came to reveal the Father's heart for us. Through his death, he demonstrated the ultimate expression of love, a sacrificial love that laid down his life so that we could come back into relationship with him. He not only gave us relationship, he gave us fellowship and communion to be with the Father, just as it was in the Garden of Eden. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Father loved us so much that he gave his Son, Jesus, so that we could be reconciled back to him. The Father's love never changes, and he loves us just as much today as he does when we give our life to Jesus. Romans 8.35 reassures us that nothing can separate us from Christ. No affliction, no turmoil, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness or peril or sword can separate us from his love. Say with me together, our position in God's heart will never change. Our position in God's heart will never change. One of the obstacles that may hinder us from receiving the Father's love is being scarred by our earthly fathers, the father figures in our lives whom we look up to. Some of us may have been hurt, rejected, or abandoned by our fathers. Some of us have had fathers who weren't there, who were absent, who were too busy with work and caught, and too caught up in the busyness of life, all of these experiences and conditions can leave us with hurt, emptiness and burdens that we cannot carry on our own. We end up dealing with these emotions, often bottling up our pain, suppressing our feelings, and eventually exploding, especially as men. We try to push through, through the pain and ignore our feelings, but what we don't realize, dear brothers and sisters, is that we are often wounded there's a hurt in our hearts, an emptiness that can lead to being numb, cold, broken, and insecure. Fear, worry, anger, anxiety, and depression, and even suicidal thoughts can come and take root. You know, many of these hurts from the past can stop us from receiving God's love. We live in a broken world filled with broken people, and people are not perfect even well-meaning people. I want to tell you, I'm not perfect, and there are so many times where I've had to apologize to my children for speaking words that have hurt them. Sometimes words that we receive from a father when they haven't been spoken in love or in the right intention can be damaging. And sometimes those words hurt far more than any physical punishment. If you've ever been hurt by your earthly father or father figure, I want to encourage you to lay that before the Lord. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That means all of our burdens, our worries, hurts, our resentment, our unforgiveness, give it all to the Lord Jesus Christ 
who promises to give us rest for our souls. God the Father loves us with a great love. He wants to change our life and bring healing and wholeness. He wants to reveal to us how high, how wide, how long, and how deep his love is for us. The Father's love is not something that we can learn. It's something that we all need to receive. We can only give what we carry, and we can't give out what we haven't yet received. Just as the moon receives light and reflects light from the sun, we too must receive the Father's love and reflect his love to all the people. And the Bible says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Better relationships with our spouse, our children, our friends, our community, our church, all begin with receiving the Father's love. Come to the Father through Jesus and allow him to heal every hole, every hurt, every trauma in our hearts and be filled with the love of Jesus and the love of the Father so that we can carry his love into all of our relationships and circumstances. The next time your conditions and circumstances cause you to question whether God loves you, remind yourself of this. His love for you will never change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because he's the same, we know that his love for us will never change either, which means our position will never change in the Father's heart. You are his child and he loves you. Allow his unchanging love to change you. Remember... No matter your conditions or circumstances, your position in God's heart remains unchanging. Just as Tyrus has an unwavering place in my heart, you too have a, in, you, you too, in the heart of our Heavenly Father, his love for us is constant and unconditional. Happy Father's Day, and may you walk in the fullness of the Father's love today. God bless you. <laughs> Great job, mate. Well done. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. If I could um, have the worship team come and join us. What an amazing. Can we just thank uh, Levi again? Just <laughs> such a powerful prompt for us all. Um, and again, that continuous theme of you know, love, God's love for us. Very interesting. Um, I remember um, one time talking to a friend um, and I was talking about being a parent and how it can be challenging at times, and being a father, and um, and he said to me, he said, Aaron, always remember that your children need your love, but you don't need theirs. And I was like a bit taken aback by that idea, but then I realized, where does love come from? It comes from God. Uh, yesterday, a group of the fellas got together for breakfast and um, I had a word from the uh, scripture from the morning, which is 1 John 4, verse 7. And it says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. God pours out his love on each of us freely. And as fathers, we're called to do the same. David shared how, you know, and we've probably all been there. If you've got teenage kids at one point or another where one of your children has turned around and said, I hate you. And you don't say, I hate you back. You say, I love you. And I would say, everybody in this room who's been walking with God for any time has had multiple occasions in their life where you've screamed out to God. And you might not have said the words, I hate you, but you might have felt it. Why is this happening? Why did you let that happen? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? And God doesn't hold back from or withdraw his affection he pours out more love and more care and more generosity. And this morning, as we reflect upon these incredible testimonies and encouragements and words from these three dads, I want us all to reflect on 
the love of the Father that is freely available. And just as Levi said, God is pouring out His love to you to heal wounds. And David shared, we have a choice to make. So for a moment, I want us all just to close our eyes. Just where you are, I want you to intentionally and actively decide to push away distraction. To forget that you're in a room full of people. Imagine you're just in this place by yourself. Nobody else is here. Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed. There's nobody looking around you here in the presence of the Lord. Imagine you've come into the throne room of heaven. The only other beings in the room are angels there to bring comfort and protection. And sitting on the throne in front of you is God, the Father Himself. He's not there to condemn or to crush or to bring shame. But He's inviting you in so He can lavish His love upon you. And I know for many of us, as we imagine that, we start to have feelings that we're not worthy. We start to have feelings that we're not good enough. Why would He invite me in? Because He loves you. Because He's your Father. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, He loves you. He's your Father. His heart is for you. So this morning, with no one looking around, every eye closed, If you're here today, you've been hearing these amazing encouragements from these great men of God, and you know that you need to make a decision to get yourself into that position to receive the love from God that He freely gives, to put Jesus on the throne of your life, to hand it over. You know that you haven't been living for God. You haven't been putting Jesus first. You haven't been devoted to a loving Father. And like I said, nobody's looking around and all I'm going to ask you to do is to make a decision, a choice today to respond. And just where you are, where no one is looking, all I want you to do is raise your hand if that's you. If you know that today you need to make a decision to give your heart to Jesus, Just put your hand up where you are as a sign of surrender to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I see that hand. Well done. Well done. God's speaking to you. Yes, I see that hand there as well. It's powerful, courageous. Yes, thank you. Yes, I see that hand there as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It's great. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace and for your mercy that you so freely give. Lord, we thank you that you pour out, you lavish on us your love, even when we're not loving you back. But this morning, along with those people who raised their hands, Lord, we choose today to run back in to your presence, to intentionally be in relationship with you, to fix our eyes upon you and to honor you and to glorify you. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus so that we could freely come into your presence and remain in it for all eternity. That Jesus paid the price for our mistakes, for our sin, for our brokenness, so that we could be made made clean and holy and righteous to be welcomed in to the embrace of the Father. Today, may we be transformed and renewed. May we be reminded again 
of your goodness in us and through us. May every person in this room, whether mother, father, daughter, son, regardless of position, regardless of stature, regardless of age, may we all be reminded that we are image bearers of the Most High, created by a sovereign God for relationship with the loving Father. Pour out your presence again, Lord. Pour out your presence in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, today we thank you for every father in the house. We thank you for every sacrifice made, for every time a dad has pushed aside what he wanted to do to serve his children and his family. We thank you for the heart of the father that you've put in each and every dad in this room. Thank you that you've forgiven and set us and sanctified us and set us apart so that we can be godly dads. And Lord, I pray for a supernatural anointing to be on every father in this house, that no matter what situation or circumstance they're in with their children or those who look to them as a father figure, may you redeem it, Lord. May there be breakthrough in that space, holy hearts in that space and love in that space your anointed presence upon them. Heavenly Father, we just pray for abundant blessing on each dad. In fact, could we ask the dads just to stand up where you are? If you're close to a dad, lay a hand on him or uh, get around, extend a hand. We just want to pray for dads. Come on, let's get up and get around to dad. Someone close to you, just put a hand on their shoulder. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, every dad in this room, pour out an anointing upon him. May there be protection. May there be provision. May there be words of encouragement. May there be peace in his heart, excitement inside of him. Lord, may he sense your presence so strongly and so evidently in all that he does. May he be refreshed and renewed and rejuvenated each day as he wakes up knowing that he has a plan and a purpose in his life directly from heaven put upon him by you. May the hurts of the past be void. May they be healed. May he be restored in spirit and in truth. May the words of your gospel, of your son, come out of his mouth and speak life over his children and his family. May his hands do good works, Lord. May he be strengthened. Bless every father in this room. Bless them, Lord. Bless them right now. Anoint them, Lord. Anoint them. Sweep through this place. Sweep through this place, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you that you are holy, a holy God. And we honor you in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, can we thank all our dads? We love you. Happy Father's Day. Don't want to leave you too late. I'm sure lots of you are going out to lunch and all of those kind of things. But there is pizza available out in the uh, foyer area and heaps of bread if you need bread. Don't forget to hang around and get a photo. If you didn't get a gift, if you're a dad here and you didn't get uh, one of the little gifts, a little catapult or a plane to make when you get home, uh, make sure you come and see one of us because we want to make sure you've got a little toy to play with. Uh, that'll be cool. Uh, but hang around and encourage the dads. Give them a card. We'll give them a high five and love on them. And can I encourage you also to chat to the guys who shared a word today. Bless you and have a great week.